22. Of 22. Because the great things
see y'all again this morning. And I know some of you think, oh, it's that guy again. Well, I'm kind of like a bad penny. I just keep showing up. But anyway, I do appreciate the opportunity of having to be with you these couple weeks. And and uh, and uh, let me go ahead and get you to turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter number 5. And as you turn there, let me just say again, thank you for this opportunity. I've enjoyed the Sunday school hour and then this opportunity to be with you as well. And uh, I do uh, covet and desire your prayers for my wife, <laughs> Debbie and I, uh, because early uh, Thursday morning, we'll begin our first leg of a trip. Uh, we'll be flying, I, I think we'll leave in Love Field at uh, 6.30 Thursday morning uh, to fly to Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, we'll, uh, in fact, we'll spend the night in a hotel there at the Charlotte airport. And then we've got to be back at the airport, at uh, Charlotte Airport, at 4.30 on Friday morning because we're going to meet up with a group from Mercy Church there in Charlotte, North Carolina, college group and the college pastor. And we're going to begin our journey to Nairobi, Africa. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord willing, this time uh, next week, we'll, we'll be in Nairobi, uh, uh, Kenya, <coughs> Africa. And so just pray for us for a safe trip and also that God would use us as we'll be doing various things. I'll be preaching some and, and we'll be, I think we'll do some vacation Bible schools working with college students and, and uh, this man that family are going to be with, he's from Kenya, but he came to the United States several years ago in order to go to Crystal Bible College. And uh, we met him and his family uh, when he was a youth director at a church we used to be a member of in Saxe. And now we're, of course, at First Baptist Church Rowlett. And uh, anyway, that's where we met them. And, and then they moved from there, uh, from Saxe to Charlotte, and became part of this church. And this church in Charlotte, North Carolina, is their ascending church. And so they've been in, back in Kenya about two years, started a church and a women's ministry and all, all sorts of neat things God has enabled them to do. And, and uh, in fact, they're that couple, they're kind of like our adopted kids, and they've got three children, uh, Anaya, Zeke, and uh, Ezra, who uh, are kind of our adopted grandchildren. In fact, they call us Nana and Pops. And so, anyway, we're looking forward to being with them, but also primarily we're looking forward to uh, the opportunity to be able to minister uh, the Word of God. So we'll be there, uh, we'll, be, we'll be in Africa, from uh, June 14th uh, till the 24th. We'll begin to make our way home on the 24th. So just pray for us uh, that we'll have a safe journey and that uh, God's hand will be on us, His anointing will be on us, that He will use us for His glory. All right, Mark chapter 5, and uh, we're going to begin reading verse number 21. And also, let, let, let me say this, I just have this thought. My wife and I... Uh, in all these years, we we've been on uh, we've been in well over twenty uh, been on well over twenty uh, international trips, foreign mission trips, but we've never been together on on one of them. This will be our first missionary trip together, international trip. So, so y'all pray for us, pray for me that I'll stay in the spirit. Amen. And, and, uh, <laughs> So you, you, you husbands understand what I'm talking about, amen. And so, and but, but no, I, I'm looking forward to it. And, and the reason it worked out like that, and Debbie, my wife, she's been to Kenya several times. Now, I've been to Ghana, West Africa, but I've never been to Kenya, but I've been to several other places in the world, like India and other places. And uh, But this will be our first trip together. We're, we're, look, we're looking forward to it. So, so just pray for us along those lines as well. So Mark chapter 5. And begin in verse number 21. Mark 5 and verse 21. Notice your Bible says, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was near nigh unto the sea. And behold, there comes one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. That is, Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus. And besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hand on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, 
And much people followed him and thronged him or crowded him. Now, skip down to verse number 35 of Mark 5. Mark 5, verse 35. It says, While he, that is Jesus, yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why, why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth a tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was coming, he said unto them, Why make ye this ado? And we, the damsel, the girl is not dead, but sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he takes the, the father and the mother of the damsel, the girl, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel or girl was lying. And he took the, the damsel, the girl, by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway, or immediately, the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Now for the next few moments, again, hopefully the Lord be my helper today, I want to talk to you from this passage on, on this thought and theme, and that is, regardless of what your experience has been or what you think about it, folks, what I want you to understand what this passage is teaching is that it ain't over even when it's over. Now probably some of you will recognize this reference. But Yogi Berra uh, was a professional baseball <laughs> legend who died in 2015. As some of you know, he was a catcher, and then a manager, and a coach. And Yogi Berra played 19 seasons in Major League Baseball, all but the last for the New York Yankees. But he is best known for what is referred to as his Berraisms. You know what I'm talking about? These are his expressions or his sayings that make no sense whatsoever. Which, as he himself put it, I never said most of the things that I said. <laughs> now, here's, here's some of my favorites. He said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Well, what other choice did he have? Uh, Yogi Berra said, it's like deja vu all over again. That's one of my favorites. And then he said, a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. And I, I got to think about that. Was there ever a time when a nickel was worth a dime? And then he, uh, he made this down. I guess it was one of the teams that beat them. He said, we made too many wrong mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I begin to think about that. Has there ever been any such thing as a right mistake? And then he made this statement again, I guess, to a team that beat them. He said, you wouldn't have won if we'd beaten you. <laughs> you, you. You think? <laughs> and then, and I guess it's one of their uh, training sessions with one of those teams, he said, all right, man, I want you to pair up in threes. <laughs> He must have went to school where I went to in South Louisiana. <laughs> then then, then he, he made this statement, and I think you'll catch this. He said, even Napoleon had his Watergate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All historical events, but two different ones. And then he said, and, th and you may not have heard those others, but he, he said this is probably the most famous one. He said, it ain't over until it's over. Well, I, I just want to say, that because God is God to whom the impossible is possible. Folks, I just want to say again that it ain't over. In spite of what Yogi Berra said, it ain't over even when it's over. And, and that's what J. Iris, a religious ruler, experienced when he encountered the Lord Jesus. 
But you know as well as I do that there are those times when it seems when we're in a situation of life where we just feel like we're hopeless. We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school. When we feel like we're hopeless and, and helpless and even hapless or unfortunate or when it seems to be over. And so when you find yourself in those type of situations, what do you do? Well, I want to suggest to you, among other things, that you ought to do, we ought to do what J. Iris did here at court into Mark chapter 5. Well, what did he do? Well, notice he did at least these four simple things. Number one, J. Iris, when he found himself in this situation, when it seemed to be over, he simply came to Jesus. So I will say to you now, what we need to do in those type of circumstances is we need to come to Jesus. Now, this account of J. Iris and his daughter is the last of four events that actually began over there in chapter 4 of Mark that illustrates this glorious truth that Jesus Christ indeed is Lord. But what we find in these accounts is not so much a definite declaration of Christ's Lordship. I mean, you won't find in chapter 4 or chapter 5 this the statement that Jesus is Lord. And so... You, you will not so much find a definite declaration of Christ's lordship, but you will find a dynamic demonstration of his lordship. For instance, back in chapter 4, verses 35 through verse 1 of chapter 5, we see that Jesus is lord over the disturbances or the difficulties or the storms of life. And then here in chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, we see that Jesus is lord over demons. Or Lord over evil spirits. And then in chapter 5 again verses 25 through 34. We see that Jesus is Lord over disease or sickness. <coughs> and then in these verses we just read. We see that Jesus is Lord. He is even Lord over death or separation. Speaking of the separation. The separation of the soul and the spirit from the body at the moment of death. And the bottom line, if you haven't already caught on, is very simply that Jesus Christ is Lord, period. I mean, he, he, he's Lord this morning. Now, it's interesting to notice, and I'm, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but the next time you read through the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, see if you can catch it, pick up on this. But it's interesting to notice in the four Gospels that basically... What our Lord Jesus Christ did in his earthly ministry was to begin to reverse the curse on sin that began in Genesis 3 when man sinned against God and fell. And what we see Jesus doing do, do his entire earthly ministry is that he began, basically, he began to undo what sin had done. Or to put it another way, he began to disinfect the effects of the fall. And basically, the four major effects or results or consequences of the curse on sin are storms. That's why we have tornadoes and, and, and hurricanes. And, and, and another consequence is, it is, demo, it is demonic invasion, the invasion of demons in our world. And, and, and then another consequence is sickness or disease. That's why we get sick. And then eventually, that, that's why the, one of the consequ major consequences of the of the curse uh, of the curse on sin or the fall is death, and so every time the four gospels that our Lord Jesus calmed a storm, and every time that He cast out a devil, and every time that He cured a sick person, and every time He caused a dead person to uh, to live again, what He was doing again was to reverse the curse on the sin of mankind. Now, personally. I don't think it is accidental nor coincidental that the last category mentioned here in Mark chapter 4 and 5 over which Jesus demonstrates his lordship is death because, I mean, you'll recall how that in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 26, Paul said, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. The last enemy that shall be destroyed by the Lord is death. And so, Again, we see J. Iris here coming to Jesus, showing you and I as well what we ought to do when we go through those seasons of life when it seems to be over. But I want you to notice how he came. Notice that he did not come to Jesus 
flippantly or haughtily like it's no big deal. But notice rather, he came to Jesus fragilely or he came to him humbly. That, that word fail in verse 22 that we read a moment ago means very simply to descend from a high place to a low place. Now I want you to notice that in this verse, that 22nd verse, Jairus is described as one of the rulers of the synagogue. Now, right now, that may not mean all that much to you, but I want to tell you that is very significant, and it's very significant for at least a couple of reasons. First of all, when it says that he was a ruler of the synagogue, that meant he was one of the leaders in the synagogue who oversaw the worship services in the synagogue, which meant, among other things, that Jairus was a man of prestige and a man of prominence and a man of prosperity in that community. And then the second significant thing is, is that when the popularity and fame of our Lord Jesus began to grow and spread, it was not good for, a, uh, for an Orthodox Jew to be identified with him because John chapter 9 verse 22 says that if any man did confess that he, that is, that Jesus was Christ or the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, he should immediately be put out of the synagogue. So here is Jairus, one of the rulers of the synagogue. And so when he came to Jesus, and especially when he fell at Jesus' feet publicly, he was possibly forfeiting his position, his prominence, and his prosperity, and he knew it. But what I want you to see this morning is that Jairus here was a broken man. He was a broken man because of the condition of his daughter. And so he was at the point in his life that, that brother, he could really care less. He could care less the cost he had to count and the price that he had to pay. And that's exactly why he came to Jesus fragilely and humbly. I mean, he was a broken man. He was broken who desperately need, needed a blessing for his family. But I want you to notice that and I think it's ironic to me, notice that it was at this place of brokenness. That's the place where his blessing began. I mean, did you catch that? His, his needed blessing began on his face at the feet of Jesus. And folks, I'm just telling you that sometimes what we need in our life is what one of my board members, one of my friends, Alan Ardwine refers to as FaceTime. You know what I'm talking about? Where we just, brother, we just get on our face at the feet of King Jesus, and we just pour out our hearts to him. Sometimes well, we, we need that. And I want you to notice that J. Iris learned a powerful, a paradoxical principle of how the kingdom of God operates, and that is, very simple, among other things we say about it, the kingdom of God operates on this principle that the way up is down. That's what J. Iris learned. And so when you face a situation and you're like, perhaps you face one of those this morning. I don't know. That seems to be over. I mean, when all hope and help is gone, man, just, just come to Jesus. Just come to the Lord Jesus and fall on your face at his feet. And folks, we ought to come to him because we believe what I believe Jairus believed, and that is that Jesus could do what no one else could do for him. But then, when it seems to be over, not only do we need to come to Jesus, but also notice we need, like Jairus, to call upon Jesus. And that's what we see in verse 23. But, but I want you to notice here how he called. Notice he did not call ca upon the Lord casually and calmly. But rather, and there's this note, he's called upon the Lord frantically and desperately. Notice the Bible says there that he besought him greatly. Now what that means is, here is Jairus. This prominent man, this ruler of the synagogue, on his face at the feet of Jesus. And that, when it says it was on him, that means that he begged him much, or even vehemently, and almost has the idea of violently. It means forcefully, passionately, or intensely. Now, there's one thing I want you to notice about this that J. Iris is not down there at the feet of Jesus, bartering with Jesus, trying to make a deal with Jesus. Now, Jesus, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Brother, he's not down there bartering. He's begging. <laughs> Do y'all see that? And no, what I want you to see, this was no cool, calm, collected, casual cry. 
But rather it was a frantic, forceful, passionate, intense, desperate cry. In other words, here J. Harris was, was not having a quiet time. <laughs> or he, was, he wasn't having just a little talk with Jesus. No, sir, this was a desperate cry of a desperate dad who was willing to count any cost and pay any price and to forfeit his pride of position by falling on his face at the feet of Jesus. But let me ask you this question. Why was he so frantic? Why was he so desperate? Well, you saw it because his daughter was dying. But I want you to know something maybe you missed. Now, I remember when I used to read this, I would miss this. But I want you to notice the tenderness of this scene here. Notice the tender scene here. Here's Jay Iris on his face at the feet of Jesus, and he says to Jesus, My little daughter, my baby girl is dying. She's dying. And I beg you, please come to my house and touch her that she may be healed and she will live. Let, let me ask, do, do, do you see that? I mean, but, I mean do, do, do you, can you feel that this morning? Now, I know that verse 42 says that girl was 12 years old and technically not a little girl, much less a baby. But to this day, even though our two sons are grown, our oldest is 40, our youngest 38, from time to time we still refer to them as our baby. And they always will be our babies. And so we see here the utter despair of a desperate dad. And folks, I just want to say to you that desperate situations demand desperate action, not business as usual. Well, see, there's our problem. We just want to carry on like it's no big deal. But did you also catch this declaration of faith in verse 23? When he said to Jesus, Come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now, we can say a lot of things about faith this morning, but for the second time, we're not. But what we see here is that faith is not merely believing that God can do something. But like J. Iris, real Bible faith is believing that the Lord will do something. Not that he can. Now, we know he can. But we're believing that he will do something in this situation. And this type of faith is often born in desperation. And folks, I want you to hear me this morning that many times desperation is indeed the doorway to deliverance. Or despair is often the prelude to the grace of God. And oftentimes the reason we don't see God do more for us, whether in our personal lives, in our family, or even our church, because, among other things I can say about it, is because, brother, we're, we're just not fragile enough. We're just not humble enough. I mean, we're not frantic enough. We're not broken enough. We're not desperate enough to come to the Lord and to call upon Him and to cry out to Him. Now, I don't know if y'all saw this movie that came out last February, February a year ago, called The Jesus Revolution, about the Jesus movie that began in the 60s and 70s there in California, but swept across the entire nation. And uh, I, I read the book by Pastor Greg Laurie that the movie was based on. Basically, it was about him when he got saved and about his pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith. And, uh, and you know, y'all remember what the Jesus Revolution, what Jesus movie was in the 60s and 70s, where a whole bunch of, uh, a bunch of hippies there on the West Coast got saved by the grace of God. And, and, but it wasn't just contained there in California, it swept across the entire nation. In fact, it swept way down there in the south of Louisiana where I was living because before I got saved, I'd been to church maybe two times, maybe three times at the most. I wasn't raised in church. But basically, and I'm not necessarily proud of this, but the long and short of my personal testimony was is I was just one of those dope-smoking hippies down there in south Louisiana that, that the Lord Jesus saved by His grace. In fact, the guy who led me to Christ had been a drug pusher on my high school campus. And so that was the crowd I ran around with. And, and, uh, and so anyway, but the Lord saved me, called me to pray soon after that. And, uh, and what's funny is several of our friends that, that know my story, they went and saw that movie, Jesus Revolution, and they told us, they called us or sent a message to us, said, hey, we just saw that movie, The Jesus Revolution, and we thought of Brother Mike. Amen. 
We knew that's what he was. And I tell you, that's kind of my unofficial biography, that, that, that movie. Because if, you, if you've ever seen the movie, if you haven't, I would encourage you to see it. Great move of God. But anyway, about a year or two before Pastor Chuck Smith, who was featured in that movie, before he died, Pastor Greg Laurie, y'all probably heard the name Greg Laurie there in California, was interviewing him. And they was talking about the Jesus Revolution. They was talking about that Jesus movement there in the 60s and 70s where literally thousands, thousands if not millions of, of hippies and others were saved by the grace of God. I mean, it was, a, it was revival. It was a move of God. And he asked, he asked Pastor Chuck, he said, Pastor Chuck, do you think we'll ever see another move of God like that in America? Do you think we'll, we'll ever see another great awakening like that? And he said that Pastor Chuck Smith's response was simply this. He answered by saying this, well, I don't know because I don't know if we're desperate enough to see God move like that. I mean, we think we've got everything to get. We're... We're perfectly comfortable with the way things are, even though they're falling apart around us. But folks, it's like Dennis Hadner said, the problem is the times are desperate, but we're not. And I pray that God will make us desperate in these days. And folks, I don't know if you notice this or not, but if you haven't, can, can I just inform you this morning, if you haven't noticed this, that the daughter that we call the United States of America is dying, if that might be breathing his last breath, and brother, we need for God to do something in our nation. I mean, may God bring us to the point expressed in that Casting Crown song that says, if we ever needed you. If we ever needed you, Lord, it's now. Lord, it's now. And so when it seems to be over, we just need to come to Jesus. We need to call upon Jesus. I think it was last year, and I think about this, these guys oftentimes, but I was in my study, I was in my office there in Raleigh, and I was just thinking about three of my preacher friends who are now with the Lord, with whom I would regularly talk with. At least one of those guys, we would talk at least once a week. If it wasn't one, it'd be the other. If it wasn't the other, it'd be the other. If they'd call me, or I'd call them, pretty much on a weekly basis. Now, all three of those preacher friends are with the Lord, and so I'm just sitting there in my office just thinking and began to feel a little sad. I said, you know what, I, I wish I could just pick up the phone and call them one more time and just hear their voice one more time. And, and, I, and then, then I thought, I knew, well, I, I can't, at least for now. But in the very next moment, as I said, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, well, well, well Mike, no, you can't call them and talk to them, but you can't call me and talk to me. And it reminded me of Jeremiah 33, verse 3, where that uh, the prophet Jeremiah in prison said this, God said to the imprisoned prophet, Jeremiah, call unto me. Now, he's in prison. He said, no, here's what you can do. Even though you're shut in, I can't be shut out even in this prison. He said, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That, and that's why some refer to Jeremiah 33 3 as God's phone number. J E R 33 3. Amen. Remember that next time you need to pray. So when it seems to be over, we need to come to Jesus. We need to call upon Jesus. But then, number three, we need to continue with Jesus. And I want you to notice that he, J. Iris, continued with Jesus faithfully and consistently. In other words, what we see here is that he was not giving up or going back. No matter what happened. Now, I know on the surface that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. But folks, you need to notice what happened between verse 24 in which Jesus agreed to go with Jairus and heal his daughter at his house and verse 35 in which Jairus was informed that his daughter had died. Now, notice here, if you got your Bibles open to Mark chapter 5, that beginning in verse 25, we see that as Jesus was going with Jairus to his house to heal his daughter, that's when that woman with the issue of blood, this, uh, the, this physical bloody condition, broke through the crowd that was thronging or surrounding Jesus in order to touch his clothes and be healed. And you know that account, how that she did and she was healed. Well, you know, you'll notice how that Jesus started to talk with her and to declare to her that her faith had indeed made her whole. But what we missed, and again, I missed this for the longest what we miss 
is that Jairus was there the whole time. The dad of this dying daughter. He was, he was standing there watching and listening as Jesus dealt with this woman with the issue of the Jairus was right there. And folks, I'm convinced that for Jairus, this had to be a detour. That was an unexpected detour. That was also a time of disruption and delay and possibly or probably even a time of disappointment with the Lord for him. But what's amazing to me is, is that Jairus continued with and stayed with. I mean, he hung in there with Jesus the whole time. I mean, he didn't quit on Jesus because of this need to a disruption, delay, and disappointment. Just like Jacob that we're reading about over there in Genesis chapter 32. Here's Jay Harris, just like Jacob there in Genesis 32. He grabbed a hold of Jesus and said, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And you know this, that life, even for the believer in Jesus, is full of these detours. I mean, how many of you have gone down paths you never expected to go down in your life? I mean, it was a part of the plan. And life for the believer in Jesus is full of these detours and disruptions. You ever have disruptions? And delays. Lord, we need for you to do something now, but for whatever reason, he doesn't immediately move. And, and, and life for the believer in Jesus is even full of these disappointments. Now, I know there maybe some of you hyper-spiritual people here this morning, you've never been disappointed in your life. Maybe you've never been disappointed with God. But I'll, I'll say this, and I'm not setting myself as something special because I'm not. But folks, because really this shows that I'm not special. Listen, there's been times I've been disappointed even with God. You know, Philip Yancey, one of my favorite Christian writers, if you've never read the book, y'all read the book that he wrote that's entitled Disappointment with God. And that's one of the things I love about Philip Yancey. He's just, he, he's just so slap on us. <laughs> so a lot of us, we try to hide. See, we put on these fronts like everything's all right. Well, we know everything's not all right. I know I'm not supposed to be disappointed, but I am disappointed in this. And I want to say to you that when, not if, but when they happen, the question we must ask is, are we going to stay with Jesus? Or are we going to stop on Jesus? Are we going to give up and go back? Or are we going to go on with Him? Even in spite of these type of things happening in our life as a child of God. <coughs> now, I don't know if y'all noticed this, but beginning in 2020 with the COVID crisis, that there were several high-profile, well-known worship leaders and pastors and preachers who on social media came out publicly and said that they were renouncing their faith in Christ. And these were leaders, worship leaders, well-known worship leaders, <coughs> preachers and teachers saying that they were no longer a Christian and for all practical purposes they were now an atheist or an agnostic. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I can guarantee you more than, more than likely the reason they did that is is because they faced one of these detours unexpectedly in their Christian life. That, that, that they face one of these disruptions. They, they experience one of these delays. They, they experience one of these disappointments with the Lord. And so they just gave up on the Lord. But folks, I want you to notice and understand that these detours, <coughs> disruptions, delays, and disappointments are not necessarily denials. But often are, as J. Iris learned, doorways to greater demonstrations or, or, or miracles. Now, folks, you would have to agree with me that it is a miracle. We talk about this a little bit as we close Sunday school this morning. One of the reasons I still believe in miracles that God can perform miracles today is because I believe in God. Amen. Period. The reason I believe, and I know about supernatural healings, and I, if He wants to raise people from the dead, I'm talking, I know about supernatural miracles. The reason I believe in supernatural miracles is because I believe in a supernatural God. Amen. And so it, it is a miracle. To heal a sick person without doctors or medicine. But you have to agree with me. It's a far greater miracle for the Lord to raise a dead person from the dead and make them live again. And what we discover from this 
is that disappointments, now, now listen to me, disappointments in our life as a Christian are often indeed God's appointments. <laughs> Those disappointments you have experienced or perhaps have experienced this morning or will experience, they're often God's divine appointments for our life. I remember about three years ago when my wife Deb and I were going to, uh, to attend and I was going to preach at a uh, Bible conference on Labor Day, and we do this every year. Well, this particular year stands out for the reason I'm about to share with you. Uh, there in the town of West Texas, where the fertilizer plant blew up right outside of Waco. Well, we've been doing uh, Bible conferences beginning on Friday night of Labor Day. We can go through Labor Day at Monday at noon, myself and several other preachers and singers, whatever. Great time. But I remember this particular year, uh, about three years ago, we left on that Friday afternoon about two o'clock to get there, and it only take about two hours to get there, or we thought. And uh, and so I, I have this ways map out. All right, so I put that on my on my little viewer screen in my car, so to see how how to get there from Raleigh, get to town of West Texas. And, and I don't know, probably because of. <coughs> Friday afternoon, which was again Labor Day, a whole lot of people going out of town, or there were wrecks, or just, I don't know. But the traffic, more so than normal, was backed up there in the Dallas area. The road we, we had to get, be on. But all of a sudden, the little ways that began to take us different directions. And, and we began to take us down these various detours. And my wife and I, we saw parts of Dallas that we've never seen before. <laughs> now, I say something, because see, I've been living here since 1980. She has lived here all her life. She's just a plain old girl. She's from Plano. I call her Plano, Texas. <laughs> but I, seriously, I mean, we, we saw, I mean, we took detour. That, that, that app took us detour after detour after detour. And finally, we, we drove onto the grounds of that camp where I was going to be preaching at. And as God is my widow, I told my wife, Debbie, I said, I have no clue how we got here. <laughs> Honestly, I did. But, but we did. We, we, we made it. And I got to think about it. But the reason we made it is because we listened to, we looked at, and not only did we just listen to and look at, but we lived out or we obeyed the instructions that we were given. See, as Mary and Martha learned, according to John chapter 11, after their brother Lazarus had, had died, that even when Jesus is four days late, he's still right on time. 19th century African-American slaves sang this song, sang these words. God may not come when you call him, but he'll be there right on time. Folks, among other things I can say about the Lord, he is an on-time God. He is. Even when his time is not our time. In Revelation 17 and verse 14, the Bible says, These, speaking of the Antichrist, and his army shall make war with the Lamb. Now, folks, you talk about stupid. So here's these people, the Antichrist, the army, making war with the Lamb, with the Lord. And as if, not really need to say this, the Bible says, And the Lamb shall overcome them, no big deal. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him, that is the saints, those who have been saved, us, those of us who have been saved by the grace of God, are called and chosen and faithful, or you could say consistent. And again, that verse says that they are with him. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but as for me, I want to declare and confess again this morning that as for me, I'm with him. And if you're going to be with him then and there, then you've got to be with him here and now. And furthermore, I want to declare and confess that I will stay with him. I will continue with him. I'll abide with him. I mean, come what may, come hell or high water, sink or swim, live or die through thick and thin, through good times and bad times, I'm with him, so help me God. I, I was just reading as I'm reading through the Bible again, just reading this morning, uh, in John chapter 6, how Jesus says some pretty hard to understand things, harsh statements to these disciples, not just the twelve, but there, there's multitudes who followed him, those who followed him thus 
And all a disciple is is somebody who just follows him. There's different levels of discipleship. But these people up to this point, they followed him. But because of these harsh sayings, it said many of those who followed him followed him no more. Well, they said, we can't handle this. We're going back to the house. So Jesus turned to the twelve. He said, all right, how about you guys? How about y'all? Will, will you also go away? That's a good question for us. I mean, there's a lot of folks abandoning the faith. You, you do understand that. So we're going back to the house. We're, 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 we've had enough of this. We don't understand it. It's just made my life harder rather than easier. <laughs> I, I'm going back to the house. I'm not following in no longer. So will you also go away? And old Simon Peter spoke up. Now, most of the time, he, he, he should have kept his mouth shut, but he, he, he got this one right. He, he said, Lord, where are we going to go? To whom shall we go? I mean, honestly, where, where are we going to go? To whom shall we go? For you have the words of life. And we are sure and we are convinced that you are the Christ, the one and only Son of the living God. So we just need to come to Jesus, call upon Jesus and continue with Jesus, even when it seems to be over. Then finally this morning, we need to count on Jesus. And that's what we see in verse 36. And notice, we're to count on him fearlessly and confidently. Now that phrase, be not afraid, is a present imperative. That means it is a continuous command. I mean, this isn't just a helpful hint or a subtle suggestion. It is a command, a command to be obeyed continuously. D -d Don't ever be afraid. And the phrase on the belief is also a present imperative or a continuous command as well. In other words, Jesus was telling Jairus, now Jairus, stop fearing. Now why did he tell him to stop fearing? Because he was fearing. Stop fearing and keep on believing, or cease fearing and continue believing. And folks, I believe he's telling us that as well. Cease fearing your circumstances. Now, I've never seen a day in time, beginning in 2020, when even church folks are so, and I guarantee you, probably there's some folks in your church, and I'm not holding this against them. I know some people are not physically able to come, but I've said there's probably some folks who could be here, but the reason they're not here is because they're scared to death of COVID. They're still scared to death to get out. They're gripped by fear. And so Jesus will say, Cease fear in your circumstances. And continue believing Christ in spite of and the midst of these detours, disruptions, delays, and disappointments because regardless of what you think about it, God is still moving. He is still working. He is still up to something. Folks, I want to remind you this morning that God, the one and only true and living God revealed in the Bible, he, 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 he's, he's still God. And He's still good. And He still causes all things. Not most things or even just some things, but He causes all things to work together for His glory and our good. Some years ago, a preacher friend of mine shared a story about two men and I checked it out for myself read about it, heard this story about a man looking at a particular painting in the Louvre Museum there in Paris, France. The title of the painting was Checkmate, and it was painted by a German artist. And in that painting, you can Google this for yourself after the service, and in that painting, entitled Checkmate, you'll see a man playing chess with the devil who has a sly grin on his face because he, the devil, thinks the game is now over, that he has won. Now this young man he's playing with, with has lost not just a game of chess, but he has lost his very soul. I mean, as far as the devil is concerned, now this is the message of the painting, the man has no more moves, hence the title, Checkmate. Well, one of the men looking at it moves on to view other paintings, but the other man who just happened to be an international chess champion stayed to look at that painting a little bit longer. 
And so he stood there and he stared and he studied closely with a chessboard in that painting. When all of a sudden he, he saw something he had not seen before, he steps back and he exclaims out loud, It's wrong! It's wrong! Because there is another move. There is one more move. So he quickly runs down the art museum to find his friend and brought him back to show him what he had found. And basically so many words, the chess champion said that the artist was wrong because he said, notice, look, look, look here. It's not checkmate. There's one more move. Specifically, he said, the king has one more move. The king has one more move. Folks, I will tell you, in a sense, that's what Jesus was saying to J. Iris when basically he was told, J. Iris, we have to tell you this, but the game's over. Checkmate. Your daughter's dead. Don't bother the master anymore. It's over. But basically, Jesus said, J. Iris, I don't care what they say. I want to tell you, it's not over. It's not checkmate. The game is not over yet because I've got another play. <laughs> I've got another move. The king, me. The king has one more move, and he did by raising his daughter from the dead. I, I'm pretty sure that the day Jesus died on the cross, the devil, the devil thought, game over. It's checkmate. I've won. You know, the Bible kind of indicates that. That when Jesus died on the cross, the devil and demons of hell, they probably threw a party because they thought, it's over. We, we, we've won. He, he, he's dead. He's done. He's defeated. It's over. But see, what they didn't realize is that though it was Friday, Sunday was on its way. Because the Lord has one more play, the king has one more move. Because up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. And so, folks, what I'm trying to get you to see this morning is that it's even for us. Now, folks, it's not over even when it's over because the Lord has one more play. The king has one more move. In fact, he always has, always does, and always will have one more play, one more move. Until he makes his final move and he returns and establishes the new heavens and the new earth. In other words, th this is what I love about this Bible. You will notice that there's no devil in the beginning and there's no devil in the end. <laughs> We're just in that in-between time. But what we find in this Bible is that God will have the final play. God will have the final word. God will have the final say. And God will have the final move. Folks, I'm just telling you, it ain't over. You may think it is. But it ain't over even when it's over. Because it ain't over until God says it's over. And when God says it's over, says it's over. When God says it's over, we want to be over. You know why? Because Father knows best. Amen. 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 Well, while we have a word of prayer, we could just bow our heads and close our eyes and ask our brother and sister if they would come. We're going to have a, uh, just a, a verse or two of the invitation song, and, and I'll be here. And if you want to stand, you feel welcome to do that. If you just want to remain sitting, that's fine as well. But I'm going to pray for us, and then they're going to, uh, they're going to lead us in a, song, a verse or two. And if you need somebody to pray for you, pray with you. Uh, just whatever if the decision you need to make, you just obey the Lord this morning. All right? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for this account in the life of J. Iris and the Lord Jesus. That teaches us that, Lord, even when we think and we feel in our own personal world, in our, in our body, in our life, in our family, that it's over. That, Lord, as long as we have you, it ain't over even when it's over. And it's not over until you say it's over. And when you say it's over, we want it to be over. And Lord, I do thank you 
for that glorious day that's coming where you're going to have to find the but we, we hear a lot of voices in our world today. A whole lot of voices. But Lord, you're going to have the final say. You're going to have the final word. And we thank you for it. Father, just help us. Encourage us today. Help, us, help this church even as they pursue a, a new pastor, Lord. And maybe sometimes they felt like, well, it's just over for the church. But Lord, help them realize this is your church. It's your church. And Lord, you said upon this rock, I will build my church. Unless you lead otherwise, Lord, help them to know it's not over for them. Even when it's over. And it's not over until you say it's over. Pray you help them, Lord. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Let's turn to page 448. Just a closer walk. 448. 